Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we have our next forensic challenge. This will be for lab two, which is entitled Lost Property. So this scenario, uh, number one note to myself, I wasn't sure on the time frame. I couldn't quite recall. Uh, I think uh, that, uh, I think this takes place in 2005. I think the, the image was in 2005. So I'll leave myself a note here to update that. Acme Unlimited has a problem. The other day, a mysterious laptop, a Mac of some kind, was discovered abandoned in the lobby of their corporate office building. A security guard collected it and turned it into lost and found, but after a week, no one had come to claim it. Ben Carson, the manager of the IT department, called M13 Investigations, and an investigator came out and took an image of the device. Because of the low priority of this case, the investigator didn't take any further information. They should have enough to prove the identity of the owner of the laptop and return it. Um, I'm going to have to make a, another note for myself. Um, ben Carson should not contact M13 Investigations. This should be probably just an internal thing. It doesn't seem like it's a, a high priority thing. So this will just be like Ben Carson contacts you and wants you to find out who it belongs to so they can return it. Uh, in addition to that uh, requirement, we have some questions that I've added here. Examine the file with the MD5 hash of 33 blah blah blah. What is the make and model of the camera used to take the picture? When was the picture taken? Be precise. When was the picture last modified? Compare the file and the image with the one included in the scenario. Are the pictures the same? Are the files the same? Explain your answer. If they are different, what might explain these discrepancies? Uh, the picture in question is here, lab2.jpg. Um, provide an export of the directory tree and hash list for each, each partition. Provide the computed hash for the image. As you can tell, if the image contains a verification hash, do they, hash, do they match? What does this mean? What can you infer about the user from the data before you? Feel free to speculate, but explain and support your arguments. Um, the I do have the evidence item up here in autopsy. Um, when ingest was done, and autopsy predictably hanging once again, I got to upgrade this. 414 clearly had, uh, had some issues here. Uh, if we go to the acquisition details, we can see um, this was evidence item 2. Mac WD JRL did the original uh, acquisition acquired on January sixteenth, two thousand five. Yes, so there's my date. I got to change two thousand five. Acquired on Windows two thousand and again, autopsy hangs. Um, acquiring software version was four nineteen A. Does not have it has a software version. It doesn't have a software name, but 2005 version 419A sounds like uh, access data's forensic toolkit to me. Um, we have an MD5 hash. That was the only hash that was computed at acquisition. So um, if we want to get a SHA-1 for our report, we have to do something else. So I've fired up, <clears throat> excuse me. So I fired up uh, FTK Imager, and I've also imported that image into this. Uh, we can see um, there's that MD5 hash. It's the only one that's on the image. So we can verify drive slash image here. Uh, we can get our SHA-1 hash and uh, add that to our report. I've already gotten a start on the report. Some of the uh, It's a good idea when you get the template report to fill in the stuff that will be on every report, like for example, your name and such, uh, maybe even throw a document version in there. Just make sure you change the date as you go um, and clear out some of the uh, template stuff that I have in there so that you have a, a clean workspace. You don't want to include anything that's, that's not going to be filled out. We've already got our SHA-1 hash in there. There's our MD5 and um, drive geometry can also be found here in uh, FTK Imager. We have 512 bytes per sector, 2,000, or sorry, 201,600 sectors, which means that it's 103,219,200 bytes, or about 100 megs or so, give or take. Um, we can also see with FTK, we did ourselves a uh, ver uh, uh, verification hash. So we can see right here the MD5 computed, the stored. Um, so this is, the stored is what was acquired at acquisition. 
right? So in 2005, when JRL took this, an MD5 hash was computed. Just now, when we did the drive, or sorry, we did the image verification, we computed another MD5 hash. We can see right here they do match. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this muted. I wish I could control shift B in Word, but for some reason I can't. Okay. Uh, result is a match. This means that the MD5 hash at my position matches the MD5 hash computed at verification. The image is still intact and forensically sound. That term is one that uh, we should have been at the, if you're, I'm recording this before the semester begins. So you're a student and you're, you're here um, trying to get uh, some, uh, there we go. Uh, trying to get some, uh, some, if you missed a lecture or missed the lab in class and you're, you're trying to get some insight into what's going on, that term forensically sound should be one that you are familiar with by this point at least I, I certainly hope so. Um, which it is just a term that means that in terms of its forensic viability and the reliability of the artifacts that we have on it, it means that for all intents and purposes, including legal purposes, the image that we are working with and the drive as it was acquired back in 2005 is identical and therefore all of the artifacts can be considered uh, sound. So that's one question down already, and we haven't even gotten started yet. Let's uh, do some of the other things that we need to do here that would be fairly easy. Uh, getting a, um, where is it? A export of the directory tree and a hash for each partition is pretty simple to do here in autopsy. We can generate a report. We can do uh, files. We can do text. Comma, uh, this is fine. You can do a CSV, comma delimited. That's fine. You can also do... Uh, an Excel report, although you might as well just do that. An Excel report and an HTML report are a little bit different. You can get uh, the directory export with those, but um, we're going to just leave it at this. We're going to just throw everything in there for now. And that will output, uh, output right here to our case file. There's a reports directory. And that gives us a, a file list hash values for every file, including permissions, and so on. And that's a pretty good record of what we have. Now, of course, when you get to larger, more realistic disks, um, this can get pretty big. But as a CSV, it will always be about as small as it could possibly be, right? And there's no harm in doing a complete export just about all of the time, uh, because that gives you also an inventory. So since we can't, we're not going to copy and paste that into this report. That would be, uh, would be insane. So we'll say C attached CSV export, and we will simply upload that along with this. We could copy and paste it, but um, why would we do that? We just attach it. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I got a frog in my throat. Um, the last one, what can we infer about the user from the data before you? Feel free to speculate and support your arguments. We won't know until we take a look at the data itself, of course. Uh, and the first question, examine the file with the MD5 hash of blah, blah, blah. What does the make a model use? That one, we're going to have to find that file in order to, to answer. Um, but before that, we need to go and complete our report proper. So this will be unknown. Mac laptop. Leave that that for now. Um, we may come back to that later on. This we will also fill in as we go. Executive summary is here. Contacted by Ben, ben Carson of, if I can't remember the name of uh, Acme Unlimited. Acme, uh, Ben Carson. Manager, I'm, it's hard typing around a microphone, I'm sorry. 
uh, IT manager of Acme Unlimited requested examination of unknown laptop recovered from um, the lobby of their corporate offices. Same rule applies, by the way. If you didn't see, uh, if you didn't see the video for Lab One, I've been typing for three or decades or more. I have certain idiosyncrasies in my typing, which results in a lot of uh, errors. And uh, if I have not been able to train them out now, I probably won't be able to. So um, you're going to see me with a lot of typos and stuff. Just know that uh, under normal circumstances, I mean, it's perfectly normal for me. Hold on, I'm going to turn my volume up a little bit. There we go. Notice I was a little quiet here in OBS. Um, anyway, uh, you're going to see that there, I'm going to leave a lot of typos and grammatical errors and, and stuff like that. Know that I do go back and fix those up. The video will just put together our first draft. I would uh, normally, before submitting this, and you should before submitting it, go through this with a, a finer tooth comb. And for me, that usually means I take five to ten passes with proof reading which is a real pain in the ass but i for some reason in my brain consider that to be a better alternative than just learning to type accurately the first time so uh i'm gonna have to recover from the corporate offices uh lap. and we're gonna leave it at that actually because we're gonna come back and we know more about the laptop objectives um discern the Owner of the laptop, if possible, return to owner. Well, actually, that's not our objective. That's our objective. The rest of it will be handled by somebody else. I already have the image name in there. I already have my uh, intake start and end. I already have uh, my the MD5 and the SHA-1 that I calculated. Again, the SHA-1 is not on the image. You have to... Uh, take it into a, another utility in order to check that out. Um, I also have a third utility up here that we uh, haven't used yet. Well, we've probably actually already used this in class. Um, but this is uh, File Analyzer. I'm a big fan of File Analyzer. Um, it's from Safer Networking, the same people who do uh, SpyBot Search and Destroy. Uh, sadly, it has not been updated. It's not no longer supported. Uh, 2011. Version 20557 is the last version that's going to be available. However, uh, it is a really good utility. It works really well, and um, it is just great for uh, just quickly looking at, at files and getting hash values and stuff. There are plenty of other utilities you can use to compute hash files. All right, hash values. I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Hash values. Um, but um, I like File Analyzer because you can compute hash values. You can do a lot of other things with files to take a look at them from various different perspectives. Um, and it's just perfect for that. So File Analyzer, and there is a portable version. If you don't have administrative rights over, like, for example, university la uh, lab machine or something like that, you can grab the portable version and you can use that. All right. Item one, I already updated, can be described as an image from an Apple Mac device. I'm going to need to update that. The photo available. Ash of the original evidence. This, I'll be, place that down here. Uh, we are going to get rid of this because we did not do acquisition in this case. Um, I suppose we can probably just do this. The and now here's a trick. When we computed the SHA-1 in FTK, we did not hash the original evidence. Okay, we are hashing a working copy that has been provided to us. The original evidence is the actual drive in the laptop. So we do not put the SHA-1 value there. They did not compute a SHA-1 value when they did the acquisition in 2005. So not computed at acquisition. This is the original evidence. This is the evidence we are looking at right now. Um, all right, we are going to get rid of this. Um, and we already have a drive geometry, fire scan results. 
Oh, uh, we we normally would do a, an AV scan, uh, but we're not. Uh, there's no files to examine. I think in this one, and we can move right to an examination of funds. Um, and this is here. Summary information. Uh, accounts. <clears throat> I'm going to move this off to the side where you can't see it while I do. Actually, hold on a second. I just realized I'm doing a split screen thing here. It's hard. It's hard working with just one monitor. Um, 105 total. 105 total. 85 allocated. 16 unallocated. That math doesn't add up, does it? No, it doesn't. Uh, oh, that's right, because we have 20 in slot. Wait, that math doesn't add up. Hmm. Not sure what to make of that. Uh, we are going to have to update. We, when we did Lab 1, we had to update this. I, it's probably this version of uh, Autopsy. But the count report in the summary information during the first lab that we tried was also incorrect so maybe there's a bug in this older version of autopsy hopefully it's been fixed by the time you get to whatever version you're using all right there's our relevant findings and all that we're going to come to in a bit all right so we want to determine who owns this laptop there's a couple of ways that we could do that this is a mac so we don't have a registry to examine but that's just fine there are other things that we can look at but first let's do a survey. So the process of a computer investigation is largely about what is known as disambiguation. So this is a fairly small drive. It is bigger than the last one that we worked with in lab one. Um, but uh, of course, in, uh, in most cases these days, the drives that we're talking about working with can extend into the multiple terabytes. And that's just a tremendous amount of information to go through. And that is disambiguation. You have a haystack and you're looking for a needle, right? And um, in order to, to find it, uh, you need to have some kind of methodology behind you. Otherwise, you're just going to go insane randomly looking for the thing you're looking for. So in order to do this, we do exactly what you do at a, a scene when you're seeking evidence sources and you will establish, well, you employ what is known as an investigative process model, right? Uh, and that means that you will employ specific scientific methods to essentially search for something. Now this gets this go this this topic runs the gamut from you know the very simple and obvious to the potentially complicated, but for the time being, since this is just merely the beginning of the semester, uh, we'll we'll keep it uh, easy and accessible for now. So, for example, if you're out at a physical scene, you're going to establish like for example a search grid or something like that, and that ensures that there are fresh eyes looking at essentially every inch of a crime scene in order to find things that may not be you know readily apparently obvious right you, you walk into a garage you expect to see a car but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you know looking in the corners on the tops of the shelves and stuff like that that's why you establish a search grid because then there are people who are searching in 20 to 30 minute intervals uh, with fresh eyes and are more likely to notice something you know that would not necessarily be readily apparent or obvious given the scene now in a digital sense we do the same thing but of course it's not a physical space so we um, we can't, uh, uh, cordon off and make multiple passes over, you know, a physical space, but you know, the principle is essentially the same. Uh, what we do is we will just search different specific areas and certain people may be, if you have a large forensic team, rather, uh, maybe cordoned off into different things, different, uh, aspects of a search. So for example, this is a Mac, but if this were a windows, one person may be assigned to examine the Windows registry. One person may be ex uh, assigned to examine, you know, SRUM data. Um, one person might be, you know, might take a certain partition or a certain drive and, and so on. So you, you divide up the work uh, and then individually you can establish your own search patterns. Um, the first pass is generally what's known as a survey. And uh, so what we do is we, we simply walk through the file system. Uh, and get a general idea of where things are, um, and uh, and that helps us to establish where we can even begin to search, because you, you of course, need to understand what you're dealing with before you can start parceling off uh, work. 
So for example, here we have 10 volumes on this Apple device, um, which it's an Apple device. So we expect to see a lot of volumes here. Volume three has files actually in it. This one's unallocated. This one's got an un unallocated chunk. This one's got files in it. Volume four has got files. So I'm going to expand that out. Uh, volume five is an unallocated chunk. Volume six has directories at the very least. Um, seven is an unallocated chunk. Eight has an unallocated chunk, but it also has carved files. Uh, nine as well. We also have bad blocks. And 10 has orphan files, unallocated files. Difference between an unallocated file and an orphan file is unallocated space when, um, well, we would have covered this already in class, but just as a refresher. Um, when you delete something from a file system, it's not gone forever, generally speaking. What happens is when a file is saved, an entry will be made in the master file table or the file allocation table or whatever other analog, whatever the file system is using to reference the locations of files. Um, and it's like a directory of files that are in the file system. And then uh, certain chunks of memory will be reserved to save that data. Now, the smallest chunk that can be reserved is a single sector, which in this disk here we already know from looking at the drive geometry is 512 bytes. And so that space, uh, those sectors, will be marked as allocated. So it's allocated for saving that particular file. When you delete a file from a file system, usually, um, it doesn't go away. Instead, the entry in the directory is deleted, and then those memory chunks that have been reserved or allocated for that file are marked as unallocated. And then later on, when a file needs to be saved, it looks through whatever memory chunks happen to be unallocated, and it will overwrite that data that was on there. So unallocated space could contain whole or fragments of useful data that just simply hasn't been overwritten yet. It's been deleted, as in the entry has been removed from the file system, but the data still remains on the disk. So that unallocated space is important to us. The files that we recover from unallocated space can be recovered through a process we call carving, which is why you see carved files, for example, here on volume 8. These are files that were in the file system and then deleted, but they weren't overwritten. And so we are able to carve them back out and recover them, right? Because the data is still there. We can get the file header. We can get hopefully to the end of the file and we can reassemble it. Uh, orphaned files are files that uh, existed in a, uh, in a, files that were referenced by the file system in a directory that no longer exists. So if we go to, let's see, do we have any actual bona fide orphan files here to see um no i don't see any right now uh we got unallocated chunks we have no orphan files so um files that uh, that were referenced by a directory that are no longer in the file system the directory was deleted um so we don't have any to look at here but it's it's a similar although not necessarily different. Uh, so if we saw an orphan file, we would know that both directory, that the directory was blown away. All right. So we have, uh, we have some things to look at here. These uh, unallocated chunks, we can pull them out and we can verify that there's nothing in them. Uh, but we're going to trust autopsies carver, uh, the intake script that does file carving. Uh, let's, um, we have 10 things to look at here. It looks like actually 10 volume 10. I'm sorry, not 10 things, several things to look at. It looks like volume 10 doesn't actually have anything for us specifically to look at. There is an orphan files folder, but there's nothing in it. There is an unallocated chunk. But again, we're going to trust um, the file carver here. With that. So we have uh, HFS private data. There's a directory here. There's nothing in that. There's an unallocated chunk. We've got our boot X, bootloader from Mac OS X. which we would expect to see. All right. Um, we have on volume eight, we have five carved files in here that we were looking at. We're going to, we're going to uh, triage our search here. So we're going to uh, uh, not look at volume nine for now. Eight has got these. So that's going to be uh, interesting. We're going to want to take a look at those. Uh, volume six has a bad block file. Um, 
I'm just checking to see how bad we're talking here. It's like five entries, if I'm reading this correctly. So it shouldn't be that serious. Uh, nothing there. We have some files here in this OSXD folder we want to take a look at. Uh, we also have a trash directory here. I uh, don't see anything really in it, though. There's a directory called 501 in it, which might be the result of our orphan files, although there was nothing in the directory when it was deleted. So, uh, volume four, we have a trash file also with a file, or maybe 501. Uh, my OSX is a little rusty. Maybe a 501 is just the designation for the um, recycling bin. Volume four has files worth looking at on it, and we already saw volume three does as well. And this also has a 501. Yeah, it looks like 501 is probably just something with the OSX. Let me, let me look it up quick. It's been a while. Uh, 501 OS X. Uh, it's a user ID, the default user ID. So that's probably a recycle bin for that default user. Okay. Um, let's uh, begin at the top and work our way down. That seems as good uh, a, a tact as any to take. Um, one other thing is let us let's see where is our tools. Oh, uh, that's a keyword search. We're not looking for a keyword search. Um, let's try. Let's try it. I'm not sure if keyword is the right thing to be looking for here, but there's a specific file that we wanted to look at with this hash value. So let's copy this. Let's throw this in a keyword search. I don't think that this is going to work though. Let's see what we get. Shouldn't take too long to search. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, we uh, the, we're going to need to open up. Um, that, um, reports that CSV file that we generated here with all of our reports, that's got our hash list on it. Let's search. Okay. There's our file right there. Um, so in volume three, there is a file zero, zero, zero underscore zero, zero, two, one dot JPEG. That's the file with that hash value. So volume three, uh, this one right here, we are going to extract that to the case when, you know, autopsy catches up with us. If autopsy catches up with us. Come on, you can do it, Ot. You can do it. There we go. Export that. Files extracted. Good, 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 good. Good, good, good. All right, so here is that file. That's the image we were asked to compare. Here's the image that we have from the lab scenario. Zoom out a little bit, take a peek. Um, so they appear to be visually identical, right? I don't see any differences or discrepancies. We haven't gotten to forensic iconography yet in our class. Uh, that will be coming up soon, which is why we're, we're doing this now. Uh, but we can only say that these are apparently visually distinct. We could analyze them further. You know, we could do our RGB parade. We could uh, do our error level analysis and... Um, principal component analysis, we could do all of that kind of stuff in order to distinguish further the, the visual media that we're looking at here. Um, but since we haven't gotten to forensic iconography yet, uh, all we want is a visual comparison. They seem to be visually identical. That's all we're really looking for. Um, compare the image with the one included in the scenario. We can just say they are visually identical, but may have technical discrepancies we cannot see with the naked eye. And we will dig deeper in this one. So are the files the same? Well, for that, we're going to go to File Analyzer. Here is the uh, OOO underscore blah, blah, blah that we pulled out of the, the uh, case. Here is the lab two image that we got from uh, Canvas. 
uh, and we can see that uh, they are, however, not identical. Here's our MD5 hash and SHA-1 hash from the Lab2 uh, JPEG. And then here's the MD5 and the SHA-1 from the uh, file we pulled out of um, the case. So um, the hash values do not match, which indicates there certainly are differences we cannot see. And that's uh, as far as I think we need to go with that because we're not on iconography. So um, so are, are the pictures the same? They are visually identical. Are the files the same? Um, they are not the same data. Uh, we'll just, no, actually, we'll just leave it at they are not the same. That's more succinct. Uh, so the hash value is certainly the okay, So that's us explaining our answer. Uh, uh, they seem to be identical. They're not. We know that they're not because the hash values do not match. That's our explanation. If they are different, what might explain these discrepancies? Um, the differences would be in non... Uh, hold on a sec. It occurs to me that this might be a bridge too far. This might be a bridge too far for this lab, so I'm going to leave a note to myself. Let's strike that last question if they are different. What might explain these discrepancies? Uh, because we will get to that in forensic iconography. So strike this. That is sufficient. Okay. Uh, when was the picture last modified? Um, for that, we're going to need to go to autopsy because we did an export here. Last modified was here. So we can, um, I thought there was a copy. Do I have to go to properties for this? Yes, I do. Damn. That is some shit. And I still can't directly copy. All right, let's see if I can copy like that. When was the picture last modified? Down here, we can plop that. Yes, we can. Okay. Ah, oh, God, this looks like garbage. I'll do this. And indent those one more level so that it looks more like down here. Yeah, that's better. When was the picture taken? Be precise. Okay. Well, it was created at a time unknown. Um, we do have our change in access. Now, this is uh, uh, this is the, the concept we probably have already covered in class. We should have, I think, at this point, known as Mac B time. So there is uh, Mac B is modified, accessed, changed, and then B is born. Uh, not every file system has Mac B time. Many file systems have just Mac time. So, for example, NTFS has Mac B. FAT file systems have Mac. In this case, this uh, format, this HFS format uh, for the old Mac OS X uh, only uses Mac time. Uh, if we take a look here, we can see its modified time was uh, 5.31.2004 at 7.23 and 54 seconds CDT. Uh, the change in access time uh, is... Uh, the change time is one second later than the access time, which is 2005, uh, January 9th at 9.38 and 57 seconds. Um, so because we don't have a, there's no B time, there's no born time here, um, we uh, uh, can take um, the, uh, the original Creation time would be the time when it was accessed. So that's when the file was first created, the first access. Okay. Uh, the make and model of the camera used. So for that, what we can do is, I think File Analyzer has EXIF. Yes, it does. So if we go to the EXIF tab, notice that the file that I provided you has no EXIF data. The um, one that we pulled out of the case, 000 underscore 0021, has EXIF data attached to it. Now, EXIF data is extremely easy uh, to uh, modify. 
So for example, any of these could be could be edited with any number of other software packages. Now, however, we do have a date and time of a data generation as being 2004. Hold on a moment. Did I, uh, did I make a goof here? I did. I did. We have an issue. Uh, I just realized. Our access time is not the time the picture was taken. Obviously not. It's actually uh, several months afterwards uh, because it was last modified on uh, 5-31-2004. It was last access one nine. 2005. That's my mistake. I apologize. It's very early in the morning here. Uh, we can take uh, this here is a couple of seconds after it's last modified, and uh, that makes sense. This is our earlier date, so we can take this for now and see if we get any other better um, dates for that. So we have our data time original generation, data time of original data generation. Um, uh, make and model. Here we go. Uh, image input equipment model. This was taken with a Kodak DX5430 zoom digital camera. And as I said, exit data can be modified. So you do want to take what you see here with a grain of salt. Um, uh, but until you see evidence that there has been, um, some kind of alteration or something like that, you can still use this as an indicator, right? Because these are exit data is created on the camera at image creation it can be edited later but unless we see evidence that there has been an alteration done to this image then it for all intents and purposes is camera original and we will talk more about how to determine if an image is camera original when we talk about forensic iconography a little bit later on but there are ways to verify whether or not uh, the exif data has likely been uh, altered or if it if it becomes suspect in the meantime uh, we can assume that this is correct uh, and we can verify its correctness with uh, a lot of this technical information that we see here. So you see that the exit data includes more than the make and model of the camera, the date creation. It also includes technical information about the picture. So the shutter speed, the aperture speed, and all of these other things that were um, uh, present or the settings for the capture of the image. We can use these and look at the image and then compare them via various different processes we'll learn about a little bit later to verify the authenticity of an image uh, and we can also use quantization fingerprinting to determine whether or not it has been imported into a uh, image editing program or not. So um, until we get to forensic iconography, you need not worry about it. And just say that unless you see a reason, like the image has definitely most, most obviously been altered, uh, you can use these for now until you learn to verify whether or not these values have been edited. So we have our make and model, we have our date picture, or we have, so we have our we have a picture taken date. We have our last modified date. Uh, we have the answer to this. We have the answer to this. We have the answer to this. And now there's just this. And in order to answer number four, we have to look at the data that we have available to us. And we still have to determine to whom this belongs. So let's go back to autopsy here. All right. So uh, volume three has several pictures, flowers, flowers, flowers. And of course, that's a flower. Uh, here we have Zakuski, which is Cyrillic alphabet. This is Russian. It uh, is translated here, appetizers. Ikra, uh, Gribi, Kubasa. Yeah, this is uh, Russian translations. Uh, Ikra, caviar, Kubasa, sausage, Gribi, mushrooms, so on. So... Caviar, ham, mushroom, sausage, herring. That sounds like a hell of an appetizer list. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I could go for some kielbasa myself. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got on number four. Uh, we got a TIFF file <clears throat> of bamboo. We have a GIF of bamboo. Uh, we have another image here of some kind of plant I'm not familiar with. Sakuski again, same, same um, appetizers. Uh, number six, we have the OSXD directory, which gives us. Um, we have a ch where church fountain something or other. Uh, we have a PCX file, which is a uh, an older image file. Very old, but this is from 2005. 
which does not have a translator in autopsy. So we could take this and we could take another look at it in something else. Uh, same square. Uh, here we have church steeples, it looks like. Church negative. Little little church neg. And then we have the same Zakluski. Uh, there. And on eight, uh, we had these carved files. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Uh, looks like a sunflower, a piece of a sunflower, a piece of a sunflower, another PCX file, and a PNG. Okay, so what can we determine about the user from the data before you? Uh, we're going to do this in a numbered list. So number one, uh, they enjoy uh, nature, especially flowers. Any images on the device are of flowers. Two, uh, they enjoy architecture. There are many images on the device of churches. Let's actually change this. They enjoy architecture or are religious. Um, and rever uh, this is going to be another bullet. All right. So let's do a little sleuthing here. Where is the... Let's grab the... These appear to be visually identical. And so we're going to grab the TIFF, JPEG. And is this the same as this? No, that is a different thing. Extract. And while that's extracting, I am going to need GIMP. GIMP is an open source image editing software similar to Photoshop. And uh, we are going to potentially need that in order to reverse the negative image. Oh, I already have it open for my thumbnail. <coughs> oh, Jesus. Come on, autopsy. Give me a break here. I'm, I'm asking you to extract three small files for fuck's sake. Come on. All right, thank you. Um, plants, when we're doing uh, image analysis, are known as a localism. Not every plant grows in every area. For example, bamboo does not grow uh, very well outdoors in central Wisconsin. You would never see something like this out here. I don't know what these are. Um, and the flowers that we have here, they're all, of course, going to be visually distinct, right? Every flower is going to look a little bit different. I don't know flower species well enough to be able to identify them. I mean, is that a rhododendra, chrysanthemum? I don't know. We can uh, extract them and we can we can check, though. This, I can tell, is not the same as these. I mean, one of these things is not like the other. So let's also grab uh, these other images. And while we're waiting for that... If you didn't see the thumbnail, look at it. Look at this. How does that make you feel? When you see a fingerprint on a nice clean platter like that? Right over the head? Doesn't that make you feel great? Look at it. Look at it. Okay. All right. Now we are going to pull out the old tried and true investigative tool of reverse image search. I'm not sure how this is going to go because I noticed the other day that for some reason Google decided to change their image search service from one that actually works and does things that make sense to Google Lens. And it totally screwed me up. And I'm pretty pissed off about it if you can't tell google image search used to be good and useful and now let's see what happens when i plop this guy in there
Okay. Bath Abbey. Seems to be where it's from. Yeah, this is... Google, this is garbage. Stop. Oh, that's what I now. Okay, all right. I, I I'm st this is still garbage, but I I slightly retract my statement because now all I have to do is actually just click, just the one button in order to get back to actual searching. Um, yes, this does look like Bath Abbey. That looks correct. So, uh, that image. Is this one so um october 14th 2004 on october 14th 2004 um the subject was possibly in bath uh, was possibly near bath abbey in Uh, what would you know, Bath? Okay. I'm actually going to indent that, and this will just be A. Okay, back to this. Let's try to do a search here of the one that's been reversed, see if we need to de-negative that. Uh, no, that's our church. Right there. And that was taken. So no need for GIMP here in this case, because we got it. Um now this has obviously been altered, right? If there's this is a negative. Somebody has, has altered this. Um and we, we could take a look at it. Sorry here in final analyzer. There's no exif data. So we would have to do some more advanced uh, forensic iconographical techniques in order to um, more determinations. And that's not part of this investigation. We haven't been asked to do that. So we're going to leave it at that um, for now. We'll, we'll get more to that later. All right. So this is down here. Copy down here. Subject was... And I'm saying possibly near because when we have this, uh, so this is technically inconclusive evidence uh, because the image could have been taken by someone else and could have somehow ended up on this machine uh, with, with, you know, within the, the, the few month time span we have, like we have the image being taken in May and then last modified in January. Um, so the image may have come from somewhere else. We don't have enough to say certainly the subject's hands were on the camera at the time. So that's why we have to use terms like possibly and maybe and so on, because it's not conclusive at this point. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not necessarily true or not necessarily relevant. This is the difference between evidence and an investigative lead. If it's possibly or maybe or it's inconclusive, then it's an investigative lead. If it, if it we can prove it, then it's evidence. But that's a very high bar and so we need to be careful with the language we're using and also careful while we're thinking of this about what is or is not immutable truth. We have to be able to prove it for it to be truth. We are only suspecting it in the meantime. So uh, the subject was possibly near. Oh, shit. Let's do that in plain text. At the... And that was on, this is unlikely. These are definitely copied from somewhere else. So I'm not even gonna bother. Uh, hold on, I need to specify how I know that. There is a picture of the church on the device. There. 
there is a picture of the church on the device. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here before I forget to mark this down. Subject. Um, either speaks Russian or was or knows people that do. They may have recently hosted a uh, dinner or party for those speakers. There is a an appetizer um, menu in Cyrillic English. Why does it? Oh, because I mispronounced it. And I misspelled it. Just save me from myself. There. Uh, on the device. All right. So, either they speak Russian, or they know people that do, and they, for some reason, found themselves in need of a appetizer menu. Okay. Um, we're not quite done yet. There's still one more place image, and that's that town square. Or town square. Oh, this is why Google Lens is garbage. Uh, yeah, I did find it. I did find it. This is a tower. Matches that tower. There's our fountain. There's this. This is another Catholic cathedral. This is Amalfi Cathedral. Amalfi Cathedral. Down here. Let's see. Subject. Which image was this? This was the TIFF. Do we have a decent date from that? Uh, not so much. No, this is definitely coming from another device. Um, possibly near at the Duomo and the Amalfi. There is a picture of the square on the device. So we have an international traveler. This should be indented there. They are an international traveler. And I'm allowed to say that because the question specifically says that we can speculate. So I'm speculating. Okay, uh, what else can we discern here? Uh, we don't really have that much to go off of, to be honest with you. Um, I, I am curious about the PCX files, but... Well, all right. And sadly, a lot of the OS information seems to have been blown away here. So we don't have uh, any key ring information or anything at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, we know that they most likely have access to one of these. I remember you used to be able to just right-click and copy certain values. Uh, they own or have access to a holy moly. Just copy the whole goddamn thing, didn't it? From the Eastman Kodak Company. All right. User content suspected. Yeah, we, we saw these. Uh, email addresses. Let's see if we got anything good here. Uh, doesn't look like it. Where is where is this coming from? This is one thing I wish that Autopsy did. Oh, it's embedded in the um, bitmap. That's definitely not an actual address. None of these are actual addresses. Uh, and we haven't tagged anything. 
and that's all we got. So, uh, that's the answers to our questions. Uh, the timeline. Let's let's check and see what this says. We can. I just. It's easier to see it all laid out. Okay, one. We do still have the images of the uh, flowers. We can also reverse image search as well and see what kind of flowers they are. Japanese honeysuckle. According to that. Uh, what about uh, what about our picture in question here? What's that? Oh, that's the timeline coming up. A peony. I never would have known that myself. Is this also a peony? Is this a white peony? Tagates erecta? Am I reading that right? Tagates erecta? That just sounds dirty. That's with you. I mean, I ain't mad at it, but still. Uh, let's do the rest of them while we're while we're at it. I guess got a couple more flowers here, and one more. I might have to switch to tin eye if Google's going to go about changing these things. I'm just. It, it actually isn't that bad. It's it's bad, but it's not that bad. And I at least do like how you can crop in the image now, because before I used to have to actually you know crop it myself and throw things in there. Chinese peony. Clearly, we're dealing with a red invasion here. Timeline. All right. These are the images we saw. These are the ones from May 31st. What's this? Which one is this? Oh, that's this one. Yeah, I forgot about this one. Uh, I didn't extract it, though. I suppose I probably should. Where was that? That's the one. Didn't extract it because I didn't want to go through all this, but all right. Fair enough. Come along now, come along. All right, while well, I'm waiting for this let's see again. There we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Throw that in there. Bamboo. Okay, that makes sense. It was near the other bamboo pictures. We have a Japanese honeysuckle and bamboo. It's possible that they are, you know, the subject was in Japan as well. Um, now, I went back to this because I noticed that the image that we searched for and the first image results. Oh, no, sorry. I thought that they were identical, but I realize now that in the picture from the scenario, uh, this building was under construction, and I thought it was identical to this one, but it's not because I can see that there's no construction in this one. Let's uh, browse quick and see if we can find um, another picture. Uh, well, hold on. First of all, let's open that up in a new tab. Let's see if we can find another picture of when it was under construction, and then we can better determine... Uh, when it was taken, and see if we can verify the date we have in the scenario. Because that picture was supposed to have been taken uh, 2005. Well, oh, uh, oh uh, we can say, well, let's throw it in file analyzer here. We have XF, we have no, oh, it's a, yeah, it is a TIFF. TIFF is an XF format, but not on there. Um, see if we can fi find out when it was taken. Uh, none of these show construction. So Amalfi Cathedral, um, renovation 2004. 
Restoration begins on the Duomo of Amalfi facade of the cathedral. Must include 2004. No, about 2005. Uh, local artisans and craftsmen were employed for the most recent renovation completed in 2005, but this is the Belmond Hotel Caruso Ravello. Um, uh, um, <laughs> let's instead of the Mafia Cathedral. I have a feeling that the image captures, like the uh, cathedral is one of only um, several buildings in the complex. Okay, let's try 2004 again now that we have a new search term. Uh, must include 2004. How long have I been recording this? Uh, we're at over an hour here. So I want to keep sh keep this short. We, we could continue down this rabbit hole. Somewhere on the internet is bound to be some kind of documented history of re uh, renovations on this historical building. Um, I would I would bet the farm on it. Um, but uh, I'm also not going to go down this rabbit hole and continue searching. Um, as far as the flowers and everything, we had bamboo, Chinese peony. Uh, none of this tells us anything specific they are just flower types but um you know we we do have the the uh, uh the, the they were taken probably all together in in some flower garden that has all of those varieties we could probably take a look and see yeah all of these were taken around that time that may 31st time so i am going to add to uh our speculative number one here Subject uh, likely visited a um, garden or conservatory with peony, Japanese honeysuckle, Chinese peony, bamboo. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Tegate's Erecta. And did I miss any peony? Japanese peony, like all Chinese peony. Uh, and roses on or around, uh, May 31st, 2004. Stop doing what you're doing. There. Okay, so we have that as well. Um, okay, but let's focus on, uh, whether or not we can actually figure out who this is. So without having any other information, like uh, the, any of the OS information or anything, we just have a couple of files. I don't think that we can actually determine who this is. Because um, these are just text files. They're not going to have any metadata. Um, oh, hold on. Let's actually take a closer look here at the metadata. Maybe there is. No, there's nothing in here. I don't see any author information or, or user information or anything here. There might be something somewhere that I'm missing. Um, uh, maybe in the carved files, do we have any information in the PCX?
These PCX files I would also extract and take a closer look at. There's not a native viewer here in autopsy. Let's let's just let's grab this one. It'll take me another 15 goddamn minutes with autopsy to extract a single file, but I don't want to leave this, if possible, at a at a at a negative result. A negative result is still a valid result. If you don't figure out the answer to the question, you don't know who it belongs to, it doesn't mean you fail the assignment. All right. It just means that you either the information wasn't there or you weren't able to find it. And those are perfectly valid conclusions. Don't just guess because you feel like you need to provide an answer of some kind. It's okay to not know. You're being graded on your forensic report and your process. So if you have information, you did do a search, you're turning in a decent report, that's what you need to worry about. All right. Here's the PCX file. I don't know if we can open it in Infran. We might need to get a separate viewer for it. Okay. We can open it in Infran. Uh, it's fragmented, though, and it's just uh, a piece of uh, the um, Sunflower. But there was another PCX file. I think it was up here on 3... No... Or no, that was a GIF. That's a TIFF. Um, let's extract the TIFF. And the reason I'm doing this one is because I see that this has the same format as the other pictures that were taken with the three digits underscore four digits. I also see that this says LZW plus diff, which uh, leads me to believe that the file name has been changed. Possibly the image has been edited, and there may be other information on here. If autopsy wasn't so fucking slow. Thank you. Oh my God. Where is that other CX file? Is it down here? Yeah, here we go. I'm going to grab this one too. Since we can't view it in autopsy, I want to know what it is of, especially since this one was the architecture. Okay. And we got that TIFF over here. Let's check this. All right, we don't have any EXIF data. Um, we're not going to have a map. Right, save that PCX file. Thank you. Let's confirm what we were doing. Um, I don't see anything embedded here either. Let's just do a quick scan. No. And this is... Exif data doesn't have anything embedded in here. Uh, streams, standard, security, nope. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. Let's check that other PCX file. What? Oh, I grabbed the wrong one. Okay, and it's just the dual media uh, Again, the same file, different format. Okay. Um, let's check out the boot partition, volume nine. It is blown away. The bootloader is not going to have host information or anything in it. At least it shouldn't, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh. I don't think it's going to have host information here in the in the bootx file. That doesn't make any sense, but uh, at the same time, I don't want to leave a stone unturned. And then the... No. Extends file. Blown away. OK. 
catalog. Visual guide block file, location file. Volume name. Oh, we already checked. I was blown away. Okay. Um, what? Uh, the catalog file, by the way, is the when Warren was talking about different file system. HFS uses catalog files instead of um, MFTs or BATS. That's what we were just looking at. Box catalog, what that's what we expect. Distance file. Uh, so it's been a good long time since I've seen HFS, but this definitely doesn't look right. Um HFS uh should have let's see it uh, okay so hfs is the hierarchical file system and this is hfs plus we can see uh it's got the hfs plus private data directories there um it didn't use a master file table or a file allocation table it uses a master directory block and if i remember correctly there should be a second volume that's missing here. There's volume one and volume two. And I think that the, um, I think that the MDB was on the second volume. Um, so, I mean, we're clearly not looking at a complete image here. Like there's no file system. This is, this is all we're left with. Um, And bud one, I see here. Are we actually missing some files? Hold on a sec. Let's go to the file view. Uh, the three plain text files are all going to be those. There's a Kluski. Go view the files. All oh, it's just got the five that were carved. There's two plain text Kluski. Gifts. Those are two PCX files we saw. Top over back to decay imager. I want just for a little bit of an easier view here, at least in my opinion. Although there's the MER partition map. There's three, four, seven, eight, and then three, and then that's it. This is what we were seeing before the hex B9 everywhere. Um, Oh, start of the data there. 
my main problem with Imager is navigating through like this. You get two speeds, too slow and too fast. Can page up though. Um, FFD8FF, that's one of our JPEGs. I'm looking at the file signature. FFD8FF, that's another JPEG. It sits there. Two, three. Header. Uh, external booter, boot OSX. Header here. Start extents. There's a catalog attributes. Get space. Two blocks there. Boot OSX. Uh, let's see. Bootloader for Mac OS X. We already looked through this in autopsy, but this is a little bit, a little bit friendlier view for for me anyway. Of course, I could have just new windowed it in autopsy, and it would have been an easier read as well. So, by no means is this tool specifically necessary, but let's take a second look because if we're gonna find it, it shouldn't. It uh, to be clear, I already said this, but just to reiterate. I shouldn't find what I'm looking for here, um, but also at the same time, there's not really anything else for us to go through to check. So, and it's been long enough. Uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at this version of OS X in probably 15 years, so um, it's long enough that I don't necessarily completely trust my experience in this case. So it's better to be thorough. And Got nothing there. Okay. Should be fine. Okay, unallocate, unallocated. Okay. Six. D. Uh, space. Slack store bud one um We're looking for mm, I just I just don't think that it has the information that we're looking for. You can also do a uh, directory export by the way in FTK imager. Um, if I go to the case, we can drop the CSV in there and we can compare the two the two ports here. Let's drop it here. Let's do FTK export close that and let's go back and we can compare the two here is the uh, export from autopsy this is a full file this export and this is what we just got out of oh it's gonna open it up in uh, fucking excel god damn it no don't do that open this up in notepad open with notepad so it's still CSV. Uh, we don't get all of the uh, all of the attributes, including the hash value. But this is a complete could be considered a complete inventory, as all of the files and um, uh, related metadata sans the hash list. So if you have FTK imager, you can still quickly export your um, their list. Um,
FTK doesn't have uh, that many utilities. It's, uh, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be lightweight and quick to run and does not have all of the features. It's not supposed to. So, um, let's see. Is there anything else? Did we leave any stones unturned? Let's check our report here. All right, so uh, we've answered the questions, uh, investigative leads. Um, we're going to say laptop should be returned to lost and found. And um, anyone claiming the laptop can be questioned on the contents listed below to um, identity proof the owner. Supporting details, um, the file system is not intact, but there are many images on the device as well as a menu in Cyrillic, did I really misspell it again? Oh, I didn't, yeah, and I misspelled it. In Cyrillic English, um, that provide some unique identifiers for the owner. Unique, not uniques. Um, we did have our timetable up. I was going to put those in here, uh, but it doesn't really seem like that's necessary in this case. So we are going to delete the table and the section. There's no timeline. I mean, there we could establish a timeline here, but it looks like many of those images were just put on the device at some point in the past. Uh, the disk image was analyzed. The file system was no longer in Intact and unsuitable for analysis. Remaining files were analyzed and um, uh, did not directly reveal the identity of the owner. However, They are unique enough to be used to identity proof the suspected owner should one come forward. And that analysis, normally this is where we would put our in-depth analysis, but um, we answered the questions below this analysis here uh, would be where we would put only the pertinent information to the task at hand, which was to identify the owner of the device. Since we weren't able to do that, there is no nothing to put here under analysis except for that. And that analysis is essentially the remainder of our executive summary as well. So we were contacted by Ben Carson, IT manager of Acme Unlimited, and requested an examination of an unknown laptop recovered from the lobby of their corporate offices. The disk was analyzed. File system was no longer intact and unsuitable for analysis. The remaining files were analyzed and did not directly reveal the identity of the owner. However, they are unique enough to be used to identity proof the suspected owner should one come forward. That's pretty much it. Um, and uh, we just don't have enough information to, to do that. We have plenty of information here about the person, but we don't have any specific identifying uh, things here. Uh, owner uh, appears to love nature and architecture um, as the device has many pictures of flowers and uh, old churches. These could be used to identify the uh, owner if they claim the device. There is also a menu for appetizers in, I'm going to try it again, Cyrillic 
English. Um, so they may speak Russian or know people that do. Okay. And then we save this, and that's what we get. I know it's kind of a disappointing ending. We were hoping to see more. And uh, to be honest with you, I'm equally disappointed. I might end up choosing a completely different uh, Capora for this one. I'm, I had toyed with the idea of instead uh, doing a different scenario, but I thought it would be too complicated. Um, to pull off on the second lab. Um, this is the scenario that I was also considering. I'll just show you the scenario document. Um, leave a comment if you think this would be a better scenario. And if, uh, if you're a student and you're coming to this after the semester started, uh, comment if you think this would have been a better scenario. Uh, but this is the other scenario I was considering. Peas in a pod. You are a computer forensic examiner and are contacted by Tom Jenkins, the owner of the warehousing firm. Uh, Mr. Jenkins advised you that he has received complaints from female employees about male employees viewing pornography and engaging in sexual harassment during work hours. Jenkins advised you that his company has an acceptable use policy that governs employees' use of computers. The AUP prohibits the viewing of pornography and sexual harassment using computers. Uh, Jenkins is concerned that the following employee or employees are in the information technology division of his company and are knowledgeable about covering their tracks when engaging in this type of behavior. The name of the IT director is Bob Mastinson, and he is believed to be communicating with Rick Bell, the director of the accounting department. Jenkins gives you a 3.5 floppy diskette and you, uh, uh, and asks you to examine the data on the media to determine if his employees are engaging in viewing pornography or sexual harassment. Note, images of cats are to be considered kitty porn as defined in your state, country, or jurisdiction. Images of dogs are to be considered adult pornography as defined in your state, county, or jurisdiction. Although your company policy may require you to stop the examination upon finding child pornography, please continue if you have the authority to examine CP. Um, as if you have the authority. And uh, no questions on this one. It is just to do the competent forensic report. I think that I decided not to do this because, number one, 3.5 floppy diskette is what we did in in lab one, and I wanted to provide more information to go through. And also, I think that I might, actually, maybe I decided not to do it because I don't think I can actually provide this scenario to people. Um, this might have been a closed scenario. The corporate might have been provided to me under the, uh, under the condition that I not share it with anyone. But still, if you think this would be a better scenario, comment and... Um, and I will either clear it or create Corpora to go along with that scenario. All right, that is lost property. Take care. We'll see you on the next one. We've got uh, two down, six to go. We'll get there. Don't worry.